Thank Three you. To five Thank you. Thank you, Bencha, for that excellent presentation. And we're now moving on to our final speaker. So Professor Carl Eriksson from the Karolinska Institute in uh, Stockholm in Sweden. And Carl is also the chair of the Isikos Knee Committee. And Charles, Carl is going to talk to us about biological considerations in uh, ACL reconstruction. Thank you, Carl. Thanks, David, and uh, thanks, Patrick. And um, it's a great honor to be to be among this distinguished panel of speakers. I'll give you some thoughts about timing and technique in ACL reconstruction from a biological perspective. Uh, and these are my disclosures. So what can we as surgeons influence? Well, we can influence the timing of surgery. We can influence the technique, choice of graft, fixation, size. We know that size below eight millimeters is uh, not as good as above eight millimeters in terms of the re-rupture rate. We can also influence biological stimuli and we can obviously influence tactics such as rehab, return to play and such. So we all know that the negatives effect of weighting are increased amount of meniscus injuries, cartilage injuries, uh, suboptimal kinematics, increased pivoting episodes, and increased laxity in secondary restraints, as well as increased fixed anterolateral tibial subluxation, and in the long run, osteoarthritis. And certainly, longer waiting time is longer time to decide level of activity. So, consequences of longer time from injury to surgery, we looked at the big cohort from the Swedish National Registry, and we found that the odds ratio for medial meniscus injury and cartilage injury are uh, increasing per month. So the few, more months you wait, the more medial meniscus injuries you will have and the more cartilage injuries you will have. There's another fairly recent paper looking at the MRI imaging from one to five years after ACL reconstruction. And they looked at pre-OA features and they could conclude that the greater time from injury to surgery had a great rods of meniscal lesions and pre-OA findings such as tibiofemoral osteophytes and such. So what about timing? When should we operate? Well, my answer is, if possible, ASAP. Within one week or when the knee is calm, which is between maybe four to 10 weeks, but probably not in between. So if possible, use the golden biological window, which is less than one week. Obviously, practical and logistic factors play a role in this, but if possible, do it right away. So what are the issues with acute reconstructions? Well, there are uh, risks that we have discussed, uh, uh, stiffness, uh, arthrofibrosis, but are these old fears still valid with the modern techniques we use? And what are the benefits of acute reconstructions? Well, we have a better heal and response, better biology, less muscle wasting, preserved kinematics, faster return to play and more cost effective. We recently published a um, randomized controlled trial where we looked at acute versus delayed reconstruction and we had 70 patients and one group was operated within a week and the second group after eight to 10 weeks, which is also early, but uh, still delayed. And we did act the early rehab in both groups, same rehab in both groups. And the results after six months post-op show that we had equal range of motion. There was no increased risk of stiffness, but we had better strength, better one leg hop and less muscle wasting in the acute group. We looked at the same cohort at the two year follow-up and we could conclude that there were no differences clinically between the two groups but there was also no increased stiffness in the acute group. So it is safe to do it acutely within the first week, if you do at least with this type of surgery. If we compare the whole cohort, uh, surgery within 12 weeks with the National Swedish Registry at two years post-op, we could see that functional return was almost doubled and treatment failure was reduced by 50% compared to the Swedish Registry data. So operating within the first few weeks, first two, three months, seemed to be a good thing in order to have better results. And here are the CUS figures for those two year follow-ups. You can see at the top is the acute group and at the, in the mid part, the blue line is the delayed reconstructions between eight to 12 weeks. 
and at the bottom is the mean for the Swedish registry at two years. And they were significantly better in all domains if you do, did them early on. So we also looked at the cost and the socioeconomic consequences comparing the acute and the delayed reconstructions. And we could conclude that acute reconstruction results in less sick leave days and as such fewer indirect costs to the individual and society compared to delayed reconstruction for ACL injuries. We published this recently last year. And um, in, in average, in the acute group, they had 57 days of sick leaves. And in the delayed group, they had 99, 89 days of sick leave, which was all, uh, almost always divided in two periods, one period after the injury and one after the surgery. So let me introduce you to the concept of al nabab which is my philosophy as little known anatomical and biological as possible. But let's face it, we cannot be 100% anatomical and not 100% biological, but we can try to be as little non-anatomical and non-biological as possible. First of all, we have to do like Dr. Fu is always uh, saying, try to hit the insertion sites. So that's the crucial thing. Try to be anatomical and, uh, with your, your graft positioning. But biology is what happens in between the implants. We have the graft remodeling within the knee and we have the healing in the bone tunnels uh, for fixation. So what is a biological insertion? Well, the tendon to bone healing with direct insertion. That's a biological insertion of most ligaments. And in a biological direct insertion, you have an intermediate zone with hyaline and fibrous cartilage and a direct ingrowth. You have, so you have four different layers and then you have the Sharpie fibers. And direct healing is stronger and faster healing compared to indirect healing. But direct healing requires additional factors to the graft, to at least to soft tissue grafts. So you need to add biology. And periosteum or fresh ACL remnant tissue is the biology that could uh, give you some help because they contain pluripotent stem cells, which are essential for direct tendon to bone healing. And tendon graft without the biological augment will give you indirect healing, which is weaker, and it's sort of a scar tissue healing, and it takes longer time to be properly uh, um, strong for pullout strength. And 20 years ago, we, we did this study where we cored out the CMT and, and looked at the insertion site. We've actually found these direct healing properties in this graft. And since 20 years, I've added periosteum as biological augment in both my tunnels to the soft tissue grafts, if I do a CMT or hamstring graft. And quite recently, uh, the brilliant study fr from uh, Dr. Karuda, who was the first presenter in this symposium, show that the same thing, but they also show that ACL remnant tissue, fresh ACL remnant tissue, may be even better biological potential, but periosteum had a similar effect on ingrowth and to, to give less tunnel widening and a stronger, faster ingrowth. So in conclusion, periosteum should be added in both tunnels to stimulate direct healing with chondroid differentiation. So let me show you a, a video here. Uh, which is my preferred technique. If I do a quadruple symmetry, I call it the ACL linking ring technique. And um, the standard harvest of the semitendinosus first. And uh, it's approximately 28 to 32 in Swedes, but uh, you could get away with 25, 26 centimeter long graft. Here is measuring the graft. At the free end, I do a so-called Chinese finger trap suture. I don't use uh, uh, needles through the tendon. So I just make a Chinese finger trap and then I release it with a piece of periosteum from the tibial insertion. So you have approximately one and a half centimeters of periosteum. Then I also harvest a free periosteal flap from the proximal tibial part. I use uh, tightrope suspensory fixation at both ends. I don't use a prep table. I don't want to move around in the theater. I want to be sort of in one spot to not move around the, the, the particles in the air. And I do a linking ring technique, uh, which, is, um, which gives us three rings, two tightrope rings and one ring in the middle with the graft. And you can obviously adjust where you want to make this knot, uh, depending upon how long tendon you have. So you can make it a five strand sometimes, or you can make it a four strand. 
then you link the four strands together like this with the same number two fiber wire. And then you try to equal the tension of the grass with two clamps like this, uh, push them out so you get equal tension in the grafts. Using then the same to number two fiber wire or whichever suture you have, you can make another Chinese finger trap down at the tibial end of the graft and include the periosteum at the tibial part. You can now see the chunk of periosteum sitting there, which will uh, enhance the healing in the tibial tunnel. Then I suture the free flap of the uh, periosteum to the proximal part of the graft at approximately the insertion site of the graft in the bone tunnel. So I suture it around, uh, in between and around the graft with number two or vicryl, preferably, and make a little ring around. And here's the graft sutured with a periosteum on the top and periosteum at the bottom. I like to uh, put together the four strands because I do a single bundle, not a quadruple bundle. So I use some vicryl to put the strands together to decrease the risk of synovial fluids, fluid in between the strands. And the graft length is usually 6.5 to 7 centimeters. And you get a big thick graft, put it in vancomycin, and then uh, at the end in the graft tube. This one is 9.5 at the end and 9 at the proximal part. So the, the neat thing with this uh, thing is that you can use tibial sequential drilling because with a periosteal chunk at the tibial part, you, you will have a wider part distally, but then you can have a slightly more narrow part at the entrance into the joint. So you actually get a natural stop into the joint of your tibial part of the graft. And then for the femoral part, you have the periosteum approximately where the insertion site on the on the femoral um, footprint is. So optimization of ACL reconstruction is to add biology. You get a faster, stronger healing. Uh, I think direct or early treatment is more cost effective, gives you less secondary injuries and gives you early return to play and improved outcome. So the concept of time as past, present and future is an illusion, but the concept of timing and biological approach in ACL treatment is for real. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carl. It's a very interesting, very thought provoking talk. Now we're running a bit behind, but we do have lots of questions and we're going to do our best to get through at least a few of these questions. And I'd say if you are able to, you can go to the Q and A box and type some answers in for us so we can try and get through all of the panelists questions. Now I'm going to start with a question for Professor Freddie Fu because I know Freddie that you have to leave. Yeah, um, I have to go to Mexico in a few minutes. Um, yeah. <laughs> can, you ask, can you answer one question for our audience Freddie? Yes. Which one person has asked which of the bony morphologies do you assess preoperatively and how do you do it and how do you use it? Uh, well we're still learning about it. We do 3D CAT scan and we also measure all the north side as good as we can. But I think it's still a long way to come. And I need all of you to help me because we're looking two dimensional, which is okay, but the real thing is three dimensional. So I think uh, I see now papers recently for, for, from different centers are looking at 3D, like from Ben Ma, from other people, which is very good. So I think it's a long way to go. Uh, the rotation, the, the, the TBL slope and all those things is, is very complex, I think. And this is like, even for Andy Williams, you know, when do you want to do the extraticular? I think the bone morphology probably have some dictation about that too, you know, not just the ligament itself. So all those things provides with the indication for the surgery, I think, is important. The simple thing like the morphology of the notch, if it is a small, short notch, if you're going to do a BTP big size, it's going to be a big problem uh, in, in some of those cases. So I think if you look at those things, it's going to help you, you know, uh, tremendously. But I think in the future, uh, we have to look at much more and we need one more science and one more study. Well, thank you, Freddie. Thank you for being involved tonight. I know you have to rush off, but I'm sure you can hear the applause coming. I'll from stay around. as long as I can. I will stay for a few more minutes. I already tell Mexico I'll be late. A few minutes. Okay, good. Well, thank you. You stay as long as you good. can, Patrick. Yes. So, uh, Karuda, questions for you from the um, um, the attendees, right? One question. So I pick up for you is that. How do you fix the graft in the tibial and femur, femur side? And do you fracture between the tunnels, right? 
Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Uh, I use uh, uh, ultra button, is adjustable uh, button in the femoral side. And tibial side, if uh, graft is uh, long enough, I put the interference screw to fix uh, the graft. Uh, we have a small size uh, interference screw, five millimeter. So uh, even if the graft is uh, small, we can fix a double bundle. And uh, sometimes it's very short, I put the post screw. Okay, so I suppose that, uh, do you have any experience fracturing between the tunnels? Uh, the time zero, I have never, but uh, one year after I take a CAT scan and I found yeah. some uh, tunnel coalition. Oh, breaching of the tunnels, right? Yeah, yeah okay. right, right. It did happen, right. Thank you very much. Uh, there are lots of questions. Probably you can go to the Q&A box and answer some of the questions from your fans, right? Uh, David, shall I follow to ask uh, Chen Xi Yi the other questions, right? Yes, you can ask him, Chen Chi a question. Yeah. Chi Yi, Chi Yi, are you here? Okay, I'm here. Now, a lot of uh, the attendees want to know how to how do you choose the isometric points over the femur and tibia, right? So uh, actually, I have already published uh, in my paper in OCS last uh, December. So the uh, the traditional the technical book say there is no isometric, but in clinic, we also found that in some times we can do the uh, isometric, the, the graft turn, uh, uh, the, the ACL reconstruction. When we uh, install the ACL, we measure the, 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 the graft turn of motion, we can Observe that during the from the zero to one hundred twenty, the graft always keep the the distance. There is no uh, throw out or pro out. So this is why we uh, try to do this technique. So the as you know, the synthetic ligament have very low vesicle elastic and uh, uh, very little allocation so this is very important that you put the uh, uh, artificial ligament in the joint if you fix the in the uh, you put the wrong uh, bone tunnel uh, insertion well you you will your, your operation will be uh, failure the patient have a limitation of the range of motion and uh, the graft will be uh, lecture with uh, exercise so the uh, you cannot so so as i described the the is the femoral insertion should be located in the uh, later later condyle uh, uh, region this near uh, the the posterior and the tibial insertion should be in the middle of uh, tibial insertion. Yeah. So okay. usually we keep the uh, rim number so we can easy to find the, where is yeah. the middle of the... Thank you very much. Patient. Yeah, that's an important question. And indeed, some other questions are also directing to you. Uh, so you may like to go to the Q&A box and answer some of the questions raised by, um, you know, the, our friends. Okay, thank you, see you, right? Yeah. So, so I'm here to go. Bye bye. Thank no, you so thanks, much. Thanks, Freddy. Right. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you, you Freddy. Bye -bye. I'm for the whole thing. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thanks very much, Freddy. Bye -bye. Thank you. I have a, some questions for Andy. Andy, are you there? Yeah, I am. Typing out answers. Uh, I thought you. I could see the question is disappearing. It's the top of my head, probably. So there is, there is one question which is a fairly quick one. What do, what is an LET? And then probably the most common question I'm seeing coming through for you is when do you do it and who do you do it for? Cool, so LET is lateral extra-articular tenodesis, something like a McIntosh or a Lemaire or an Ellison procedure. It is not an ALL reconstruction. I'll say that again, it is not an ALL reconstruction. That's something different. Um, and my indications basically is anyone I'm worried about. So I look at the risk factors, so any juvenile, so a child will have surgery and you, you can use x-ray to make sure you fix the graft with a suture anchor distal to the growth plate and the re-rupture rate so high in them, it's a very useful thing to do. Those who are lax, people who hyperextend more than 10 degrees, 
those with a pivot shift in their normal knee, those with a strong family history, or if the pivot shift is big, uh, all revision cases, uh, big tibial slope, but basically anyone I'm worried about. So I don't do it in everybody, you certainly don't need to. And Freddie Fu made a really important point. Just because you're going to do a tenodesis doesn't mean to say you can do the intra-articular surgery badly. You have to get every bit of this operation right. It's about attention to detail. And the LAT is simply a way of de-stressing a good ACL reconstruction. Okay, thanks, Andy. Patrick. So, uh, Bencha, questions to you. Well, I'll summarize the question. So the most common question is that, you know, for very short graph, right? Unfortunately, your graph is so short that over the tibial side, yeah. if you cannot really fix with a screw, right? So mm -hmm. have you ever have any experience of using like a button or any suspensory mechanism over the tibial side? So I, I will calculate very precisely. The graph in the tibial tunnel should be at least 25 millimeters. And the key is you should pull the graph very strong. Otherwise, when you put the screw, you push the graph inside the joint, mm -hmm. okay? Key point is you put the guide in first and then you put the graft. So the guide will be always outside the graft, right? And yep. after that, pretensioning and put the screw and you use the strongest fellow to pull the graft. <laughs> okay? Okay. Use that one. Okay. And you can always put your screw in the joint to see if there any buckling. When there's buckling, that means you, you're going to push the graph inside the joint. Okay, okay that's the key point. Yeah? Right. Thank you very much, yeah. Bancha. Very, very useful tips, right? So, Derek. Okay, Carl, are you there? Yes, okay. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Carl, there's quite a, few, quite a few questions for you, which I'm sure you're getting through. Um, somebody has asked about uh, your timing of surgery with revision cases. Yeah, I was about to, to answer that. <laughs> I was writing an answer. And obviously a revision case is, is a different uh, ball game. But if the indication is, is sort of 100% that this person needs a revision, high level athlete or someone you know that this really needs a revision, I think you can actually apply the same strategy uh, in terms of timing to a revision case. Obviously you have to look at it individually, but Certainly, I, 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 there is no use in waiting just for waiting. So I so think it's same, quite the same. Same principles. Same principles. Same principle. Yes. Okay. And do you feel that with your biological side, is there any role for P or PRP or stem cells or any other additional measure? Well, well, the the, the PRP, I'm not so sure because it's been it's been tested and they haven't seen any real. I think also Ryosuke Karuda's group looked at PRP uh, when they looked at the, the ACL remnant studies. And I don't think PRP as such makes such a big difference, but stem cells, well, you get the stem cells both from the ACL remnant, fresh ACL remnant or periosteum. So, uh, but artificial stem cells, I, I've never looked into. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Yeah, so I think we finished all the Q and A, right? Um, so yes. because of time, we can't uh, go on further, but please uh, look at the check box, I mean the Q&A box, right? And try to answer some of the questions that, um, you know, some of the attendees asking, right? So um, probably we have to conclude these sessions, right, Derek, right? I think we're getting there, Patrick. So I'll leave you to make some final remarks. Yeah, so uh, before we end, well, I would just like to remind everybody for a very important conference upcoming by the end of this year and next year, right? So December this year, from the 3rd to 5th will be the EPCAS Congress 2020. So uh, please uh, pay attention to all these uh, important deadlines, right? And very freshly, I think it's a cost just make up, uh, you know, the, the final confirmation of the dates of the Congress next year, right? Uh, next slide, please, right? I think um, the ISA cost Congress in um, Cape Town will be from the 27th of November till the 1st of December next year, right? It's very, very new uh, confirmation, right, Derek? Yes, yes. So yeah. we've we've moved this meeting and uh, to a time when hopefully everybody will feel comfortable to travel to Africa. We think it's going to be a fantastic, fantastic meeting, and we really hope we can see everybody there and travel to Africa and join. Yeah. So uh, with yeah. that, so uh, I.